to arrive, and, and uh, as um, Brother Dean has mentioned, uh, that was a, a person who died, right, that, that represents that house. And so we want to remember the family and, and, and pray for God's blessing on them. Uh, I'm sure it's a, there's a whole other story on the other side, isn't there? And uh, we want to just continue to pray for Diana, pray for the family uh, that of uh, the lost loved one that provided the heart. And we want to pray for Sister Pinky, especially. And uh, can we just take a moment and pray and uh, lift Pinky and Diana up to you, uh, up to the Lord in prayer? If you would just bow with me, Lord, we're thankful to be here, and and we're thankful to be able to lift up um, some sisters in the Lord this morning. And Lord, you know what's going on with uh, Pinky. And Lord, we're asking for your intervention. We're asking, Lord, for your healing. We're asking, Lord, that you would use the physicians, the surgeon's hands, Lord, to uh, provide what is needed. And God, just give Bruce peace. Uh, give Pinky peace. And Lord, let them know that you're walking with them. And we especially lift up Diana and Jeff to you this morning. And Lord, I'm just so thankful, Lord, as you have often reminded me that yours is a throne of grace. And you have invited us there to pray and to seek help in time of need. And Lord, we don't come based upon uh, the fact that we would be good enough to approach your throne, but we come before you boldly through the blood of Christ, who has made us righteous, who has cleansed us from every sin, and through his work on the cross, we are your children. And we praise you today, and we come boldly. We lift up Jeff and Diana. We pray for Diana's recovery. Lord, just bless her uh, with a speedy recovery. May the doctors uh, stand in awe, Lord, of, of her awesome recovery. Bless us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I do want to welcome you here and uh, pray for our youth as they're at the camp out and not too far away from here, but uh, we just pray for God's blessing on them and safety and, and uh, that they would be bound together in a spirit of unity and love, amen. Those, those relationships are important, aren't they? And uh, we wanna just pray for them that God would knit their hearts together uh, in a faith in him. And uh, just so good to be here in God's house and pray that you've had a blessed week and haven't been struck by lightning. Uh, but if you have, we need to talk to you, right? You're an amazing person. Amen. What binds us together? Have you thought about that? Why we come to church? What makes us family? You know, there's something about the cross, isn't there, that, that takes divergent groups and puts them together as one. Would you, can you say amen to that? that uh, the church, the church should be, my voice is changing, the church should be a place of reconciliation between nations. Amen? The church should be a place of, of reconciliation and unity between races, right? Amen. That there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, but we're all one in Christ Jesus. The church should be a place that is centered on the work and the person of Jesus Christ because it's through Jesus Christ that we have access to the Father. That we're one. We're one body. We're redeemed of the Lord. And when we come to church, it's not the Johnsons or the Lincolns, but it's the family of God. Amen? The family of God. And, and it's not black or white, but it's the family of God. And the church should be a place of healing, of reconciliation, of bridges being built. And uh, may we never forget that, right? He is our peace. Um, that's what the message is on today. And uh, Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, goes to great lengths to, to unpack for us the union between the Jews and the Gentiles 
under the umbrella of Jesus Christ, and what a great big deal that is. They didn't like each other, right? Jew and Gentile, they didn't like each other. Jews didn't like the Gentiles, and the Gentiles didn't like the Jews. And that was basically the two categories of the world. Jew and Gentile. And Paul, Pharisee of the Pharisees, was, was raised, if I can say it this way, in this racism of exclusivity to God, which was true. The, the Jews had God. The, other, the nations of the world didn't. But it's an amazing story to see Paul, who was steeped in this separation, steeped in this, um, uh, this attitude of rejecting the Gentiles and we're God's people. It, it's, it's an incredible story to see Paul uh, as a man who was raised and steeped in this. So it was so ingrained in him to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Pretty amazing story when you think about Paul's life that that God had uh, pulled him out of his, his narrowness and he had shown him, boy, the plan of God includes all those who will call upon the name of the Lord. Not just those that were from the line of Abraham, but all those who will call upon the name of the Lord. And Paul, he, in this uh, quite a substantial section of the book of Ephesians, uh, writes about this. In fact, I think it's the next slide. So this is, uh, I don't expect you to read it, but um, <laughs> unless you're in the back. But uh, this is the book of Ephesians. I, I, I kind of am a visual learner. But the part there in the, the lighter text, the blue, is, is what we're going to read. And it has all to do with this unpacking of Paul's new perspective. Paul's revelation that us Jews, we're not any better than the Gentiles. We all get to God the same way through Jesus Christ. And I want to just take a few minutes and read that. So if you would, if you have your Bibles open there, otherwise you can follow along. We'll have it in several slides. Paul unpacks this for us, this, uh, this truth that we're talking about this morning, that we are, if we're part of the church, we're family we are one body. There's none better. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your wealth or your lack of it. It doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. We all are one in Christ Jesus. Therefore, remember, I love that word remember. He's telling the church, listen, I know you're Christians. I know you're believers, but I want you to, to recall some things. I want you to think about this. And uh, that's good encouragement for us, isn't it? Boy, we need to be told to think about some things. We need to be told to remember some things, what God has done, what God is doing. Don't just take it for granted that it's there in the back of your mind and, and it's going to come back in the forefront when you need it. Think about it. Think about the things that God has done. Meditate upon uh, the work of God in your life. Amen? Uh, consider the things that God is doing, he's, what he's up to. That you, uh, you Gentiles in the flesh, you are, you are called... He's, he's putting some parenthetical information here. You were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Now, that's a pejorative, right? When the Jews looked out into the world and they said uncircumcised, that was not a compliment. That was an insult. That was demeaning because that meant you were not at all connected with God, connected with the move of God. You were lost, you were damned, and you weren't much good. That's what you were labeled as by the circumcision made with hands, of course, he notes. Before they came into Jesus Christ, before they met the Lord, before they came into communion and community, at that time you were without Christ. You were aliens, uh, you were excluded from citizenship, commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers from the covenants of promise. You had no hope. You were without Christ, without God in the world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. And I want to emphasize that word our. Jesus is our peace. He's the peace between races. He's the peace between Gentiles. He's the peace between the Johnsons and the Lincolns, right? He is our peace because in him and him alone, we are reconciled and made right before and to a holy God. He's the answer. I can't look down on the Johnsons and say they don't do it like I think they should and vice versa. They can't look at me. I'm picking on the Johnsons today. They can take it. I know it. They can take it. We're not sitting in judgment of one another. We're saying, you know what? We're all saved by the blood of Christ. We're all His. He is our peace, church. He is the peace of this church. He has made us one. He's broken down the middle wall of separation, which there's a lot that could be said about that. Let me say in a nutshell, the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant. Talk more about that, uh, Lord willing, in a minute. Having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man. And let me just stop there and, and, uh, and just talk about that for a minute. The Mosaic law, the covenant that, was, that God entered into with the people of Israel as they came out of Egypt, uh, tended to draw some lines, didn't it? There was, there was a lot of exclusivity to it. The way they lived, they ate differently. Uh, they lived separately. I don't want to live in the middle of the Gentiles, right? And, and God himself says, I'm separating you out. They, they lived a separate religious life. Their temple, their sanctuary, what was sacred. And you know, the Gentiles weren't even allowed to come into the temple, right? Right? That was one of the things you read the book of Acts that, that, that the Pharisees stirred up against Paul because they believed that he had brought the Gent, a Gentile into the temple area where he wasn't supposed to be. The way they viewed access to God through law, right? Gentiles didn't have the law of God, didn't even consider it, didn't think about it. They had a works-based righteousness and they would measure themselves with others. They alone were chosen. They had an exclusivity to God and the Gentiles, again, excluded. Let's continue on. So this middle wall separation torn down by Christ because now think about this, that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Mosaic law perfectly, didn't he? He kept it perfectly. And not only did he keep it perfectly, which is by God's grace then imputed to us, right? He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus kept it perfectly. The interesting thing about the work of Jesus as he lived and as he died, he also received all of the law's penalty, didn't he? Death. And even as the word says that uh, he who hangs on a tree is cursed, cursed is everyone who breaks the law. So Jesus lived it perfectly and we get his righteousness and he died as a, as a consequence of our sin, of our breaking it, and he dies in our place. So truly, he is our head, isn't he? He, is our, he lived it, and he paid the penalty for it. So he put to death the, en the enmity. He made one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now, you are, now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but your fellow citizens with the saints and the members and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom 
you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So God brings together from every race, from every ethnic group, from every nation. He brings us together through Christ. He makes us one. He tears out the middle wall of separation and comparison and exclusion. He brings us together, and what are we becoming? What are we? We are a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Pretty incredible, isn't it? That we, that God has pulled out a people for himself, that he would dwell among us and in us and through us. Verse uh, Chapter 3 begins, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, If indeed you have heard of the dispensation or the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What was that mystery? Here it is. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles, here it is, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. I think that, and and we'll come back there, Lord willing, to to verse 8, but I think that that we don't want to miss what's happening here. And that's why Paul spends this much time in this small book talking about this reconciliation between Jew and Gentile. It it really was a big deal, and it is a big deal. When we consider that the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, were God's chosen people, right? God's chosen people. They were privileged. They really were. They really were privileged. They were really uh, in an exclusive relationship with the the great I am, the God who enters into covenant. He had entered into covenant with Abraham and men like David. And Paul is writing to the church and he's saying, I want you to understand, boy, you've been made part of the redemptive move of God. Don't take it lightly. Don't don't gloss over it, but know that in the grand scheme of things, you are like the, a branch that has been grafted into a tree. That God has been working redemptively from, begin, from the beginning of time. And he has worked through the line of Abraham and brought forth the Messiah. And, and God blessed Abraham. And now you're part of that work that God is doing. Because think about it, Gentile. You, your, your forefathers were not included, right? They weren't part of it, but now you're included. God's chosen people who knew the true God, whom God promised dominion. Dominion. You think about all the things. Think about the things that that God promised Abraham and his descendants. You will be like the dust of the earth. We're part of that now. You'll be like the stars of the heavens in number you're going to be like the sand in the on the seashore god told abraham from abraham you, kings will come from you kings will come from you you will possess the gates of your enemy god promised abraham dominion his descendants dominion his descendants relationship with god god was at work through abraham and his descendants and it was exclusive and now Gentile and Jew brought one. No more schism. No more difference. Pretty amazing to think about. Now, now just consider, consider that you grew up in a privileged family. Consider that maybe you had uh, incredible access to a country club that had everything had everything. And it was based on your birthright, right? How would you, how would you have lived? You would have thought and lived differently, right? You, 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 have a, you, know, you have an exclusive 
right to this country club with all of its amenities, with all of its uh, blessings, for lack of a better word, uh, for all the things that it offers, you were born into it. It was given to you. Now, imagine, after thousands of years of this, the owner decides, you know what? I'm not going to base it on birthright anymore. I'm not going to be, I'm not, it's not going to be exclusive. I'm going to offer it to whoever will receive an invitation. Now, how would you feel if you were the one that had the birthright? I think you might kind of have a problem with that. Suddenly, all the privileges and, and, and the blessings and, and the benefits of this, of this uh, uh, country club is now available to anybody. And, and, you know, how would that make you feel, right? Boy, I thought I had right to it because I was born into it, and now the owner is just saying, whosoever will can come. Well, I think we would struggle with that. I really do. I think we would struggle in our flesh to just say, oh, that's great. That's great. Anybody can come who receives it. That's great. Come on in. I think we would really struggle with that. But you know what's amazing about the life of Paul is he, he didn't struggle with it. Of course, it was, a, it was a work of God's grace within him, right? He accepted it. He loved it. And he said, I became a, a prisoner, as we just read. I'm a prisoner to you Gentiles. I'm going out and I'm telling you all about it. That should be our attitude, right? Toward the lost, towards the sinner, towards the one that does the craziest things. We should, we should want to be embracing them and saying, come on in. There's an offer for you. Doesn't matter your past. There's a great offer for you. Let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the one who died for you who lived a perfect life and that righteousness is gifted to you and died an atoning death and his death is credited to you. Pretty amazing, isn't it? It's like us. You know, how do we respond? Are we selfish in all that we have, all that God has given us and we're kind of afraid to give it out? Well, Paul wasn't like that at all. Paul, Paul was steeped in this exclusivity and, and uh, probably pride, right? The chosen race, the race through whom the Messiah would come, the race through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. But Paul lived a life. He sacrificed, right? He sacrificed. He said, he said to these people that he couldn't stand before, he said to these people who he he didn't want to come into his temple, He said to these people that he didn't want to eat with, he said, come in. Come into the family of God. And he didn't just say it, he lived it. And he didn't just live it, he sacrificed for it. And he didn't just sacrifice for it, he went to jail for it. And he didn't just go to jail for it, he was beaten for it. Right? This man who who had this... This, this, uh, this such a narrow view ingrained in, in, in him from childhood, from birth. Now he's saying, boy, I'm going to the mat for you people. That's the love of God, right? That's the love of God. That's a, that's a fire. That's a passion within him. And why did he do it? Because he had experienced the grace of God. Amen? Amen. He loves much who is forgiven much, right? And he knew, he called himself the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church of God. I mean, I compelled people to blaspheme against Jesus Christ. I I had my hand in killing people of the way. Paul, an incredible recipient of the grace of God, going to the mat for us. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go through this for you. And I think that it's only in the gospel, it's only in the gospel that God can take people that we hate naturally and turn them into people that we'll we'll die for, we'll sacrifice for. That's the type of grace and love that comes in knowing Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? That's the type of love. He is our peace. He is our peace. Grace upon grace. 
grace upon grace. You know, you think about it, Paul, we know the story, I think, well enough that Paul, in a redemptive way, experienced the grace of God. I mean, he was going 100 miles an hour persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, and God knocked him down, got his attention, right? That was an act of mercy, act of grace. Would you agree with that? Redemptively speaking, Paul was a, a recipient of the grace of God, and he, he talked about his gifts, his gifts to teach and to go and, and to be used of God. He talked about those, uh, those um, abilities that he had as, as, as gifts from God, as, as objects of grace. So he experienced it uh, redemptively. He experienced the grace of God, and in ministry he experienced the grace of God. And he, in turn, ministered to us grace, and we, in turn, receive grace, right? All who call upon the Lord, all who will hear, all who will receive the offer of forgiveness, all who will be adopted, who will be filled. So as we wrap up here, uh, verse 8, To me, who am less than the least of all the saints... This grace was given. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your past. God has grace for you. Grace. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles, these people that I would rather never see in my previous life, But now I'm preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ. And I want all to see the fellowship of the mystery. What's that fellowship? That's union, that's unity, that's friendship, that's communion. That's sitting across the table from one another like you're at a Thanksgiving meal. I want everybody to know the Thanksgiving meal that is in Jesus Christ. I don't want us Uh, to to sit across the table or not sit at each other's table because of division. But I'm preaching to the Gentiles the fellowship that's in Christ. That wonderful meal. I mean, we've been there. We've been to those Thanksgiving where we're with family and we love it and we enjoy it and the food's good and the fellowship is good. And Paul is on mission from God to tell the world that there's unity in Christ. There is a a bridge in Christ, not only a, a bridge to the heavenly realm with God the Father, but there's a bridge among peoples. And in Christ, there's one new man. He was on mission from God to make all see what is the koinonia, the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now, now, now and in the church right here, God is on mission. Right now, God is on mission to manifest this fellowship, this unity, this oneness the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. By us. It means it's pretty important how we treat each other, right? And what we say about each other. Pretty important. Because there's a mission here. God is on mission in this church. To show this mystery, this fellowship, this this communion that bridges nations and bridges peoples and bridges races and people that would never have anything to do with another person. In Christ, we're one. God's on mission right here. By the church, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we we speak of the love of Christ And here we read of the love of God, that there was an eternal purpose within God, God's eternal purpose to bring us into fellowship with him and with each other. That's pretty loving. 
That's pretty loving. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you. For you, which is your glory. I'm doing it for your glory, for your benefit. I'm suffering for you. Don't lose heart at it, about all the things that I've gone through. I'm doing it for you. And for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I'm worshiping. I'm worshiping because God has taken enemies and made them friends. I'm worshiping. He is our peace. We all get to God the same way. Let me say that the message that we just read of reconciliation between Jew and Gentile is a forever message. It is a forever message. It's just as relevant today as it was then. That God has called us to love and to preach Christ that there might be unity. I like what one person said, the cross is God's answer to racial discrimination, segregation, anti-Semitism, bigotry, and every form of strife between men, and we can say amen. I like what another person said, in the church, Gentiles do not become Jews, nor do Jews become Gentiles. Instead, believing Jews and Gentiles become Christians. Let me just close and say that God has called us to unity. He's called us to reach out across, however you want to say it, across the fence, across the aisle, and preach Christ because in Christ there is one new man. In Christ there is unity. In Christ there's fellowship. Not only with a holy God, which is awesome and unspeakably awesome, but with one another. Worship team, would you come? Let's stand together.
our peace and we declare that you are awesome, that you are the God who takes enemies, those who cannot stand one another, those who would never want to be in the presence of another person, and you take them and you unify them and you make them one. And Lord, in this work of reconciliation through your body and through your blood, there is peace. Lord, when we look into the world, we need peace. When we look at our nation, we need peace. Too often, when we look into our families, we need peace. Lord, the world is full of strife. And in the church, there is a declaration of what you want to do. You want to make enemies at peace and one with one another, sitting at a table, fellowshipping together. Lord, help us to be the church. Help us to not falter. Help us to love. Lord, and may that fire that burned in Paul for those that he once called enemies, that fire that burned in him to go and take the gospel, that, that uh, ministry, that message, that mission of love and healing and reconciliation, may that passion burn in each of us, even for our enemies, even for those that we think are just crazy. Lord Jesus, you are our peace. May your peace flow in this place. May your Holy Spirit rain down upon us, softening hearts. Igniting within us a fresh revelation of the grace that you have poured upon each one of us and in turn that we would reciprocate that grace. Even as Paul did. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your broken body and shed blood because through it we live. We love you, Lord. Help us to love one another. In Jesus' name, 